All right, good morning, everybody. Happy, happy Sabbath to you. All right. Uh, we have quite a few announcements, so I'll get, I'll get started here with all of them. Um, just a reminder, today is there's a fellowship potluck. There's a fellowship potluck today right after church. So um, if you're visiting or if you're a member, please plan on staying and eating with us. Um, the Golden Agers, um, they have a potluck the last Sabbath of each month. So um, if you're um, interested in that crowd and everything, typically it's folks 60 years or older. So please plan on that. I think that's what, a couple, couple weeks from now or next week. Um, just a reminder, every Wednesday night at 5.30 p.m. down into Fellowship Hall, uh, we have Celebrate Recovery. So um, in the back of your bulletin there is a phone number if you or a friend would be interested in that. Just a kind of a reminder for um, coming up this summer in July, the end of July, um, the Northern California Conference Camp Meeting is happening over on the coast. So again, there's uh, more information in your bulletin than that, but start, start, thinking about, start thinking about that. It's great to get over to that weather during that time of year. Um, let's see, this one is um, in, in Shingletown, the Lassen Tabernacle Tour is going to be um, up there for um, two or three weeks. It is um, starting from 419 to 55. There is information in your, in your bulletin for that. So they have quite a few things uh, related to that. So again, that will be in Shingletown, but there are um, dates and everything there if you are, if you are interested in seeing that. Um, the school, RAA, they, we have a constituency meeting as well as a science expo. So um, that is coming up on Thursday the 2nd. So that's, that's not too far, um, just a few days out. It starts at 6 o'clock for the science expo and then the constituency meeting at 7 o'clock. But um, all the kids have been working really hard in various science projects, so they'll have those up so you can come and ooh and ah and, and make a big deal about those. So the kids really enjoy when there's folks who come and look at their stuff. So please join us then. That's uh, 6 o'clock on May 2. Um, also related to RAA, on May 16, May 16, so that's almost a month from now, um, we've made a deal with Mod Pizza. So if anybody um, goes and orders from Mod Pizza on that day, and there's a code here in the bulletin. If you, it's mod gives 25. Mod gives 25. If you tell them that when you buy your stuff, 25% of whatever you pay will end up going to the school as a donation from Mod Pizza. So May May 16 for that. That'd be. Um, Mike Coppathorn, um, who is. Um, Right, the husband of, of Carrie, the, the principal at the school, um, he did get out of the hospital. So he got out on Wednesday, and he's um, at home for about a week or so, and I think he has some follow-up follow -up stuff um, this coming week, about the middle of the week. So please continue to keep him in prayer, and, uh, but he is slowly making that, that long recovery. So he's, he's doing well, continuing on. Um, let's see if there's a... On May 3 to 11 at Palisadro, they're, they're hosting a Book of Revelation seminar with Steve Case. It's going to be unlike a lot of the stuff. Like For those of us who's, who've been to multiple Revelation seminars, it is going to cover the good material. It's going to um, focus on, it's really going to be focused on Jesus and what he's saying and what he means and stuff. Um, of course, they'll you know, some of the beast stuff, stuff that might be a little bit scary or seem weird, they'll, um, that will be covered, but not, it's not going to be focused on, you know, it's not a, a scary, you know, scare you into, into anything. It's really going to be focused on what is Jesus telling us. So um, May 3 to 6, so if you were interested or you have friends who'd be interested, um, this would be a great one for them to see. We have an upcoming cooking class. So this is plant-based cooking. There's actually an insert in your bulletin. Here. And um, it is going to be on the 28th. So that's about what, about a week or so from now. Um, after, um, it's going to be in the fellowship hall downstairs, but if you want to find out more, I think out in the foyer after church today, you should be able to find out more information. You can sign up for that. So that, that's going to be a great one. All right, I think that covers all. Oh, yeah. Real quick, we have one more announcement here. 
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, our fellow greeter, Paul, out here, and I had it pressed upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit to start meeting on Friday nights here in the sanctuary to help welcome in the Sabbath. We would like to start doing music, scripture reading, kind of like a Bible study, and just congregate with fellow believers to help welcome in the Sabbath, not just a Sabbath morning kind of thing. So we'd like to start gathering here at 7 o'clock on Friday evenings to help welcome in the Sabbath. Everyone is invited. Thank you. Starting this Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So um, now, if you if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads, we'll we'll start out the rest of the service. Dear Lord, thank you very much for this beautiful Sabbath day. It's great to be in spring, and um, see just the beauty that you've given to us, and see all everything growing. Help us to continue to grow in in your love and um, be loving to others, and show them what it's like to be a Christian, what it's like to be an Adventist. Please bless us as we continue to find out more about, about you and the um, messages and information you have for us. In your name, amen. Ooh, I like pink. Actually. <laughs> He's colorblind, so it I'm not matter. quite colorblind. Red, green, colorblind. So this is blue, this is yellow. <laughs> you know, we all have our, our weaknesses, and some of them are genetic in uh, the physical way that I can't see some colors. Some of, them, some of us have psychological tendencies. <laughs> that are faults, uh, some of us have uh, all kinds of things. So, you know, God chooses to use us human beings full of failures and uh, issues that we have, and he shows his glory in us and in spite of our weaknesses. Amen? Um, praise the Lord for that. And it's his doing. Our first song this morning is um, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a blessing that we have. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, Leaning on the everlasting arms. 
Our next song, we're leaning on Jesus, but we also have a hope in Jesus. Our hope is built on nothing less. Please stand with me as we sing this next song uh, together. <clears throat> Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness to veil his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, and blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us. Um, our next part is children's offering. Bill Adams is going to be doing our children's story. So kids, go to the back, get the baskets, and bring an offering for the, to help support Reading Adams Academy so other kids can go to school too. Thank you. Okay, kids, you know your jobs. Many deacons, if you have things to share, hold them up. The kids will come collect them. you get the outside of the rose.
If you look at the joy on their faces while they're out there collecting, if we were that enthusiastic about working for God, the work would get done in a hurry, wouldn't it? Well, good morning, boys and girls. And I look at you, and I see a bunch of brave boys and girls. You're probably not afraid of anything, are you? Well, I was when I was growing up. One of the things I was afraid of was going to the doctor and getting shots. Ooh, I didn't like that at all. Going to a dentist and getting cavities taken care of and having that drill in your mouth. Uh-uh, that wasn't fun. I was afraid. But my biggest fear was being alone outside in the dark. Didn't like that a bit. The story I'm going to tell you this morning is about one of my experiences in the dark. Well, I grew up out in the country, and I came from a large family. I mean, really large. I had nine, eight sisters and three brothers, and that means with me and my parents, there were 14 mouths to feed. It takes a lot of money to feed 14 mouths, hungry mouths. And so we grew a big garden. We had a large piece of land, and over half of our acre was in garden every year. So my brothers and sisters and I had chores to do, planting garden, taking care of pulling the weeds when the weeds started to grow, and then watering. Every day we had to water some part of the garden. Now back in those days we didn't have fancy electrical systems with plumbing and just turn on a switch and the timer and it would water itself. We had to go out and hook up a long hose and put a sprinkler on the end and we'd set it in one station and then in a couple hours we'd move it to another and another making sure everything got properly watered. Well one night, it was uh, well past sunset, it was dark, and my mom said, I think I hear the water running. Did somebody forget to turn off the water? And all of us shook our head, no. She says, well, I think I hear it. Whose turn is it to turn off the water? Guess whose turn it was? Mine. And I couldn't say, I'm afraid to go out there because then my brother and sister might laugh at me and call me a chicken or something. So I walked to the back door and as fast as I could walk, I walked out to the area where the faucet was. And just as I leaned down to turn off the faucet, there was this horrible fluttering and rattling and and I jumped in the air and ran like a rocket back to the house and I didn't turn off the water. And I got back in the door and mom happened to be in the kitchen. She said, that was quick. Did you get it turned off okay? And I go, uh-uh. She says, well, what do you mean? There's a monster out there and it tried to get me. And in the living room, my dad was hearing it. He was laughing just like you guys. I don't know why you're laughing. And he says, oh, I think that was a pheasant. You probably scared it worse than it scared you. And I said, uh-uh. Well, you need to go turn off the water, but you can take my flashlight. And my dad had this massive army surplus flashlight that took, I don't know how many batteries, but it really lit a beam in the dark. So he said, take this and head on out. So I went out and I was looking all over, making sure there wasn't anything that was going to harm me. I got out. You know what? It wasn't so bad. When I'd shine the light, it was just as bright as daylight. Went out, turned off the faucet, walked back really proud, mission accomplished, and uh, nothing got me. Do you know, boys and girls, that even though you probably don't have anything you're afraid of now, there'll come some things in life that will make you fear. This world's getting uh, close to the end of time, and there's awful things that happen. We have friends that betray us. We have sickness. We have loved ones that die. We have scary things that go on. But do you know what? Each of you, each of us, have a flashlight ready for our use. You know what that flashlight is? What do you think? God? Yeah. Actually, it's God's Word. King David, who was probably the mightiest warrior of all times, wrote 
talking about God in Psalms 119, he says, Thy word, that's the Bible, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Like a giant flashlight, right? So when things start to happen bad in your life, instead of just being afraid, we can claim God's promises. The Bible is full of promises. I looked up on the internet and it said in one place that there are over 3,500 promises in the Bible. One place at over 8,000. Whatever it is, there's a promise for about everything you might be afraid of. So when you start to get afraid, remember the Bible. Put God's word in your mouth and your heart so that when the time comes and you need it, you'll have that flashlight to use. Thank you. You can go back. So it's time for our congregational prayers. So if you guys will... Uh, join me, we'll just uh, kneel down. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, beautiful Sabbath day and your promise to be with us, especially uh, here in this, uh, your house on this day, um, your spirit with us, uh, especially be with the pastor today as he presents your message on the, um, uh, that you know all, you know all the things. I mean, we don't, we don't really have to inform you about what, what we need and what we think and what we want. You already know, but you still like to hear us. Uh, present our requests, our petitions, and our thanks uh, before you. We especially ask you today to be with the Copythorne family, uh, Mike, as he has a long row ahead of him. Uh, coming home from the hospital, he still has a lot to go through, and uh, you ask, bring healing to him quickly and completely. And um, also with uh, Linda Moore, that she still uh, has a lot to go through as well, and that uh, you continue to work with her healing also. Um, and the rest of us, we all have uh, needs and unspoken requests that you know all about, and we ask uh, your consideration, especially on this day, um, for those who are uh, ill and need healing or suffering in any way, that you'll bring comfort and healing to those who need it. Um, thank you for uh, giving us um, thousands and thousands of promises in the Bible that we can cling to uh, for every need that comes up in this world and uh, all your love and constant care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Not too many times do people that do special music have a scripture, but I do. This is the clear word, and it's uh, right after the story of the rich young ruler in Luke 18:28. <clears throat> then Peter said, Lord, we have done what you asked for that young man to do. 
We've left everything and followed you all over Israel. What will you do for us? Jesus said, Not one of you who has left his home, his parents, his brothers and sisters, or his wife and children to follow me will go unrewarded. In this life, you'll experience a joy and satisfaction that no amount of money can buy. And in addition to this, you'll be given eternal life. So as we walk on the King's Highway and we have Jesus as our best friend, we can have joy and satisfaction more than any other money can buy. <clears throat> Please sing with me while I play. Days are filled with sadness, nights are filled with song, walking in the king's highway. And the world goes brighter as we pass along, walking in the king's highway.
Today's scripture reading will be Jeremiah 29:11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Good morning again. I'm going to put my notes up here just so that they're there in case I need them. Always to have them better than not have them. <laughs> All right. Thank you all for your participation. Let's start we, with a word of prayer. Am I on? Yeah, okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we humbly again ask your presence. We are so blessed with the music, with, the, uh, with prayer, with singing. Father, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We are blessed. We are highly favored. The, the weather outside reminds us of a glorious creation. And all things are made new. But Father, for today, for this time, we ask your spirit be here so that we can understand the things that you have written in your word. And we ask for the Holy Spirit, the teacher, to come to teach. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture today is probably uh, one of my personal favorites. And if you've had a week like mine, <laughs> not that it's a bad week, it's a good week. It's just really busy this week. Um, but I did have the opportunity to help chaperone a field trip down to Rock and Water. Um, and there's a couple of you that went, and that was, the kids had a wonderful time. Uh, it's a Christian camp down near Coloma, or in Coloma. And they learned about some of the pioneer stuff, uh, the stuff that they used to do, like making candles and rope, uh, panning for gold. They got to do that a little bit some other things. It was a nice time, but it's a Christian camp, and it was very nice. They taught the, the children several times uh, biblical principles and stories and parables, and it was nice, um, and uh, they had a good time. For me and for some of the other parents, we learned how old we were, <laughs> hauling stuff to and from the car, walking on trails, bonking our head on caves and all kinds of things. That was good. So today, Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, Timmy was very helpful in, in reading it for us. And it's one of, one of my favorites. And depending on the translation, they're mo most of them are very similar. Um, I am reading from the New King James. That's, I believe, what Timmy read from. The one on the King James, which is very similar. So I know the thoughts that I think towards you, you a future and a hope. Uh, oftentimes, I've relied on that verse that God knows what he's doing, and I can trust him, although I don't see what he's doing. Uh, so we often repeat the verse, we walk by faith, not by sight, uh, which is a good verse, because oftentimes in this life, and when we walk the walk of faith and the journey that God has put us on, we don't always see through until the future, so to speak, and know exactly what it is that God is doing. But this verse reminds me that as long as we put our faith in Jesus and follow his word to the best that we can, that he does have plans for us, and he will turn those uh, plans into something Cutting in and out. All right. Well. This type here. It's a different type of mic. And hopefully. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
And of course, this is the type with no clip, so I'm going to have to put it in a pocket. All right. Wonderful. All right. So, now what did I do with my clicker? Here we go. I'm sorry. So Jeremiah 29, 11, a lot of times as we travel in this life and we get stuck in those difficult trials and um, times in our life when things are difficult and it's hard to see tomorrow, we can take comfort in the fact that God does have uh, plans for us and things and, and he, he has our best interest at heart. Now, recently, when I was, I ran across this, um, I don't want to say this internet pastor. I put it as an internet pastor. And he was telling me, or not telling me, he was, he did a little video on why Jeremiah 29, 11, we all misunderstand it. We all may have taken it out of context. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. Now, I'll be honest with you, I always come across these types of things with a little bit of a grain of salt because a lot of times people want to have secret knowledge. This is one of the warning signs where you've always misunderstood it, therefore let me tell you the truth. And so sometimes that might be true. You know, sometimes we actually use that same type of argument with the Sabbath because you've misunderstood it your entire life. It's not Sunday, it's Sabbath, so on. So it's not always wrong, but I always like, okay, tell me why I'm wrong, because I want to know, and sometimes I'm like, eh, well, this is, this internet pastor was telling me that if you read the context of Jeremiah 29, you will understand that this was for uh, the children of Israel as they go into captivity into Babylon, and it isn't necessarily for you. It was for the children of Israel. God was speaking to the children of Israel. He was promising it to the children of Israel. He was not promising it to you. So let's go to the Jeremiah 29, 11. Let's look and see what the context is, right? So let's start in verse 4. We'll just start with verse 1 for a second. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who, carried, who were carried away captive to the priests, prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So that's the context, all right? Um, Jeremiah is sending this letter to those and kind of some of the background that you'll kind of pick up from the context as we go through it is that there is some locals in Babylon that are claiming to be prophets that are giving the people the idea that they need to resist the Babylonians and, and kind of, I don't want to say continue to fight, but to resist being there and to rebel against them and to kind of be antagonistic against the Babylonians and claiming that God has told them this. But we, we pick up this letter from Jeremiah to the captives in Babylon and verse 4 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and begot sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that there may, so they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets, and some translations say the prophets, and your diviners whom are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you caused to be dreamed. Some translations translate that a little differently, but the idea is, is that the children of Israel within their group, within the captives there, had a few people that were saying, God has told us that we need to resist the Babylonians. Jeremiah is now saying, no, don't. 
God has caused you to be there. While you're there, live at peace. You know, marry and be given in marriage, not with the Babylonians, but within your, within your own group. In other words, give your daughters to the sons of, your, of the captives, and, and likewise, um, the other way around. So, but not, not intermingle with the Babylonian pagans, but, but increase your numbers there while you're there and live at peace, plant gardens, buy homes, you know, work hard, live a life while you're there because I've caused you to be there for a reason. So don't listen to the men uh, that are saying that you need to resist. All right. For, the prophet, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Then comes the famous verse. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back from the captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place which, from which I caused you to be carried captive. Because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets from among us in Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all the people who dwell in this city, and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you unto captivity. In other words, now he's addressing those that remain there. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I send them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them list." Make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. I will pursue them with the sword, with famine and pestilence, and I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, an astonish, astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among the nations where I have driven them, because they have not heeded my word, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servant the prophets, raising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed, says the Lord. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you of the captivity whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Kind of an interesting passage. That's the context. Context is Jeremiah is writing this to them. Now, if I was in Babylon... I would probably be a little bit upset if I was from Jerusalem. The Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem. They had, like Daniel and his friends, were made eunuchs. I'd be a little bit resentful. <laughs> More than a little bit. So I can appreciate the desire to listen to voices that say to resist. I can, if I was there, I would be tempted to resist myself. I mean, we probably all would. That would be the human nature. The people that have taken you captive, taken you to their land. I don't want to be in your land. I want to be back where I am from, in my home. I don't want to be in your land. I want to be in my land, in my home, and doing the things in where I am from. I don't want to do things your way. But then, you know, these, these men from among them start saying, No, oh, God has told us we need to resist. And now this letter comes from Jeremiah says, No. Don't resist. I have sent you there for a reason. Not only have I sent you there for a reason, because I have sent you there, it's going to be kind of like a protection. Because what I'm going to do back in Jerusalem is I'm going to send them the sword and famine, and pestilence. That's not going to come to those in Babylon. That's coming to those still in Jerusalem. So although I would have been tempted to resist and be um, pretty upset and depressed and all those dark and discouraging thoughts, God is protecting his people that were taken captive in Babylon and protecting them there while the people that still are in Jerusalem 
are going to have a much more difficult time. Because God is sending them a curse. Wow. It's kind of like a protection. Now, if I go back to this internet pastor, I'm just using him as an example, because you could probably find this anywhere. But he says, because the context doesn't apply to you, because the promise, therefore, the promise doesn't apply to you. That's what he's, that's the gist of his message. You're not in Babylon. You weren't taken captive into Babylon, he says. Therefore, this is God's promise to the Israelites taken captive, not to you. And so this, you're taking it out of context. It doesn't really apply to you. So let's investigate this theory, and I'm going to call it a theory, and ask a question, is there a problem with that theory? The answer is yes, there is a problem with that theory. Um, There are a lot of problems with that theory. One problem is If it wasn't spoken to you, it doesn't apply to you. I don't like that theme because if you apply that, oh, that blue didn't show up very well. If you apply that concept that if God didn't write it to you directly, that it doesn't apply to you, then that is a problem because in that case, no other scripture would apply to you either, right? So just from that, that's his big strong point. Um, If that were true, then nothing in scripture would apply to us. And scripture actually tells us differently. Because Paul, in his second letter to Timothy, says all scripture is God-breathed, right? It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. If it didn't apply to us, it wouldn't be in scripture. But all scripture, some translations say, are inspired, right? So it is all useful, and the list goes there, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. So even Jeremiah 29, 11 has something of merit and value for each one of the, us. So in one sense, that totally eliminates this internet pastor's perspective. But, and aside from him, because he's not really important to us necessarily, but I want to get this this concept through is that although the context doesn't apply, the lessons absolutely do. And the context applies too, by the way. So context in scripture can help us to understand the lessons and the principles taught in scripture. But not all scripture lessons are But all scripture lessons, excuse me for reading that incorrectly, all scripture lessons are useful for us. Uh, And what I mean by that is context can provide us what the lessons mean, but it doesn't negate the lesson, right? It's still important, it's still valuable, it's still there. Sometimes they can help us to, like, understand it better, what I mean by that. Caution, though, useful versus applying. In other words, there's some things in Scripture that are useful, but they may not necessarily apply. And what I mean by that is you go into the ceremonial systems of the Israelites, and the, the ceremonial law no longer applies because Scripture tells us it doesn't. There was a time when the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross. So no longer binding to us. However, with that being said, it can teach us lessons and it is useful for us to understand other things. Although the rules may not apply, so to speak, to us, it still can teach us things. We don't have, we're not required to keep the ceremonial law, but maybe as we study the ceremonial law or other things in Scripture, it may provide us lessons and things that we need to understand. Now, there's a certain passage in Testimonies, Volume 7. There's another one in Sermons and Talks, and I wanted to share them with you because it is, it is very, very, very interesting to me. Ellen White makes a comment that says, let the truth of God be the subject for contemplation and meditation. She uses those words. Now, this is not Eastern meditation. This is where you intelligently reflect on the verse. 
not where you empty your mind and go, mm, you know, there's a difference. So um, biblical meditation is something that we need to do. Eastern meditation is not biblical meditation. Um, but meditation, so read the Bible and regard it as the voice of God speaking directly to you. Then you will find inspiration and that wisdom which is divine. So Ellen White makes a comment that when you read the Bible, you're reading something as if God is speaking directly to you. So I go back to Jeremiah 29, 11. Would it be applicable just because when God wrote it, he wasn't writing it necessarily to me? He was writing it to me, and he was writing it to you too. That's why it's there. However, the context says, well, yeah, it was, he was writing it to the Israelites and, you know, through Jeremiah the prophet to the, those people in captivity. But you know what? It's also writing it to you and me. In fact, because it's there in Scripture, it's as if the voice of God is speaking directly to us. To me personally and to you personally. So what does that mean? That means that Jeremiah 29, 11, like every other promise in scripture, is for you individually and for me individually. That means I can trust it. I can, I can take comfort in the fact that when God says, I know the plans that I have for you, that applies to me too, right? Right? Now, can you imagine a God that understands all the plans that he has for each one of us? I don't even know my own plans. I'm glad God does, right? This is the other one that's in sermons and talks, and this is something that's really important. It's a very similar comment in the first half. Never attempt to search the scripture, uh, excuse me, never attempt to search the scriptures unless you are ready to listen. I should just stop right there, the end. I don't know how many of us, especially when it comes to topics that are under debate, that we always take the position of the teacher instead of the learner. And I, I have, I mean, I'm, I, I fall into the same category. It's just one of those things where we have to be very careful and always willing to listen to the Holy Spirit when we're studying scripture. We don't do it unless you're ready to listen, unless you're ready to be a learner, unless you're ready to listen to the word of God as though the voice or his voice is speaking directly to you from the living oracles. Isn't that amazing? So Ellen White's making the comment that, hey, if you're going to open the scriptures and you're going to study the scriptures, do so as a learner and be willing to listen to God as if he's talking directly to you. Don't say, oh yeah, he's, this is important. He's talking to everyone else, but it doesn't apply to me. Of course it applies to you, and me too, right? She goes on in the same part of the paragraph. I just can fit it all on the... All right, there we go. Oops. Oh, I did. I must have advanced it and I didn't realize it. The second half of that paragraph, never let mortal man sit in judgment upon the word of God or pass sentence as to how much of this is inspired and how much is not inspired and that this is more inspired than some other sources. And what I, mean, what I think she means by that is that we are not to say, well, this book is more inspired than this book of the Bible and this book of the Bible is more inspired than that book of the Bible. No! Uh, or this other book is more, more important than the Bible, and, or her works are more important than the Bible. That is not our work, and God does not want any part of that. The Bible is God's living word. It's his word. It's inspired in its entirety. We are reminded by that in Matthew 4.4. 4. I used this in Sabbath school today. It's, ironically, if you ever want to remember, it's also in Luke 4.4. 4. So, um, he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word in the Bible is what we're supposed to learn and study from. We don't want to dismiss this word or that word as not inspired Sometimes we come to the, to the place where we don't understand. And this is where it's really one of those tests for us. And if you're a student of the Bible, 
I've been here many times in my life where somebody gives me a scripture and we're kind of in a, some type of spiritual debate and I'm like, oh no, I never saw that before. Now, praise the Lord, there hasn't been many of those in the last probably 20 years, but as I'm growing in my faith where I'm like really don't understand something, I mean, there's ones I don't understand, but they're maybe not like hot topics. I just don't understand. That happens every day, right? Where I need to dig and learn. But they're ones that really shake me to my core. Like, I never read that before. That's been a while since I've had one of those. But in those times, and they probably still exist, where they, it's a scripture that like, oh, that shakes everything that I believe, then I have to step back and say, you know what? I don't understand this. Before I discount everything that I believe, let me investigate this verse. Let me do the work. Let me go and pray for the Holy Spirit to teach me. I will come as a learner. I will listen to God's voice. I will pray. I will search the scriptures. And I will let God's voice speak to me through the scriptures. Because it's important to let God speak through the scriptures and, and not other stuff, right? But there, there comes a point when I can learn and there's, there's, there's explanations, Sometimes, we, you know, if I get really, if you get really stuck, when I got really struck, you might go ask somebody for help. Uh, hey, what do you think about this verse? This one's really, this one's really got me. I don't understand. Help me out. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, depending on who it is. Um, but then we come back to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future, and a hope. There's a little bit of flavor here and meaning in this one verse that is just so awesome. And some of the wording here in Hebrew, the thoughts that I have towards you, ma'ahasaba and, and ha-saba, very closely related. So when the, when the verse says, for I know the thoughts that I think, all right, the thoughts that I think. Some translation says, I know the plans that I have for you. It's, it's thoughts or plans. It's the intellectual thinking and planning. That's the idea. It's the purpose. So when God says here, the thoughts that I think or the plans that I plan. That's the idea. It's a very closely related word. It's just a different form. So one's, uh, the, the thoughts that I'm thinking towards you or the plans that I'm planning for you. That's the idea. Either way you translate it, it's the same idea. It's the intellectual planning and thinking towards you. So it kind of gives it a little bit of a flavor. When God says, I know the plans that I have for you, he knows, he's thinking, he's planned it out. He knows the plans, that, and he's planning for you. There's times for me, especially when I was growing up, and I'm like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, um, Am I supposed to go down this path in a career? Am I supposed to go down that path in a career? And this is one of those verses that helps me because as I'm not able to think it out, I'm like, God, what do you want me to do? Show me your plans for my life because I don't understand them. And one of the, the secrets to know the will of God, and sometimes you have to walk by faith and not by sight. You kind of have to keep walking even though you don't understand. And you're like, well, how do I make decisions? Well, one of the biggest decisions is to obey first. Now, if it comes to two, maybe, forks in a road and both are obedient, but maybe different. And what I mean by that, it's um, you take, you know, say, uh, medicine or theology. Well, maybe neither one of them is necessarily right or wrong. They're just different. And either one would be obedient to God. Well, then that's, you're going to have to kind of do your best. But if it comes to a fork in a road and one of the ones that's often is like, well, you know, I think that God has a different partner for me and I should leave my spouse and go with this other person. No. I'll tell you what God's plan for you is. To be obedient and, and respect the marriage vow that you already vowed before God and your spouse. Right? There, there isn't, there isn't um, an excuse to not obey. So here, when God says... 
I know the thoughts or the plans that I plan for you. He knows. We may not, but he does. It goes on, and it's like to give you hope and a future. Now, or a future and a hope, depending on kind of the translation. Some in Hebrew, and so some of the English can kind of fluctuate a little bit. Here it's, um, it's in the future, and it's translated 31 times as the end. All right? Uh, the reason that this is interesting, it's also translated late, latter, last, uh, prosperity, reward. So, but 31 times it's in, but it means future. It's in the future, and the hope is translated 23 times in the, new t- in, in the Bible as, uh, as hope. 23 times expectation is seven um, the thing that I long for is also, it's also translated that way once in scripture. And you could kind of say that I'm going to give you not just hope and a future, but I'm going to give you the thing that you long for in the end. Right? It may be hard. It may be challenging, but God says, I know the plans that I'm planning for you, and I'm going to give you the thing that you long for in the end. (sighs) Thank you, Father, is absolutely right. Or the thing that you hope for in the end, or the thing that you hope for in the future, that you get the idea, right? That somewhere in the future, all this stress, all this heartache, all the captivity that we're captive to, and some of us are captive to a a whole bunch of different stuff. It might be finances or health or, you know, I don't know, pick something that you've been held captive to. Someday you're going to break free, and in the end, God is going to give you the thing that you long for in the end. Praise God. So when I come to Jeremiah 29, 11, is it for me? Yes. Is it for you? Yes. Because God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. And he uses it, says the Lord. This is not just something that God isn't saying. Says the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you the thing that you long for in the end a hope and a future. Like the Israelites, there are times when we go through trials. Maybe it feels like captivity. And those times we can trust God that he does have plans for us. And while it might be difficult, it's better to trust him because he has our best end in mind. You know, I don't know if you're a parent Some of you are, some of you are not. I know that I probably never could really understand this until I was a parent. And so if you're not a parent yet, if you become a parent, maybe someday you'll get this. But there are times when you have to make decisions for your children that are disciplinary decisions. Probably a really good example is, hey, you know, you can't have chocolate cake for every meal. It wouldn't be good for you, right? Well, God is a loving parent, and he tells us, hey, you can't have chocolate cake for every meal. (laughs) As a parent, there's times when I have to make tough decisions for my kids that are in their best interests, although they don't understand. You know, the Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. One of those things is protecting your children from negative influences, from evil influences. Sometimes, no, you can't watch that. No, you can't hang out with those people. No, I can't let you do that. 
And they're like, why? You know, everybody else does it. Why are you being so strict? Or why can't, you, why can't we do this or that? Because I'm the parent and I know. And I've been there, or I've seen it, or I know what that is. And although you don't understand, I have your best interest at heart. And sometimes they don't understand. They don't see the things that I see as a child and I'm their parent. Just like that, I don't see the things that God sees. And I have to trust him as a good parent to know what's best for me. But I know that he has plans for us. And I know that those plans are our best future. And in the end, the things that I long for, in the end, he will give us. And those are eternity with him. I think he has rewards for us here too. But one day, we will see and we will look back and we'll go, oh, that's why I went through all that. Now I see. We may not see that right now because times of trials are tough. You know, when we were in school and you ever prepared for that big test, you're like, oh, this question, mm, I don't know it. Maybe you're smart. You never had those times. I had plenty of them. The teacher doesn't come around and give you all the answers during the test, right? Just like in life, sometimes you don't have answers and you have to just keep walking by faith. But in those times, remember that God has plans for us and he knows what is our best future. We just need to trust him. For I know the plans or the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you hope and a future. Just remember that. Cling to those words. Because although the trial gets hard, the path gets difficult, he has something better for us in the future. And we long for that day. Let's pray. Father God, I don't know that we could repeat it enough. They say repetition, repetition, repetition. But to know that you have our best interest in mind. And though, although we don't see it at times, or maybe we don't feel it at times, we trust in you and know that you have our best interest at heart. And you have promised that you will have plans to bless us and not to harm us. And to give us the things that we longed for in the end. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song. Praise him because we can trust him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Sing all earth is a wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, glory to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer for our sins he suffered and bled and died he our rock our hope of eternal salvation hail Jesus the crucified, sound his praises, Jesus.
Jesus, who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, cloud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reign forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Father God, we praise you. We thank you for being a God that not only knows the end from the beginning, but knows each one of us and has plans for each one of us. Father, we thank you so much that we can rest our care in you because we trust you. And although we don't always see what you're doing, we can trust you as a good father. Father, may we study the promises that you have in your word so that we can apply them as if you're talking to us personally. Thank you for this. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath, and we will see you again soon.